our New Testament reading, our Old Testament reading and preaching text comes from Ezekiel 34, verses 1 through 16. Ezekiel 34, 1 through 16. The word of the Lord came to me. Mortal, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, Ah, you shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the sheep. You have not strengthened the weak. You have not healed the sick. You have not bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strayed. You have not sought the loss. lost. But with force and harshness, you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth and with no one to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild animals, since there was no shepherd and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, I am against the shepherds, and I will demand my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths so that they may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their own land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the watercourses, and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and with the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. They, there they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed. And I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the Sunday that we celebrate our confirmants, who just completed our extensive confirmation process. But this isn't how we wanted to do it. In a few moments, you will see a video of them. They will introduce themselves. Uh, we will ask them some questions. They will say some things. But we didn't want to do this on video. We wanted them here with us. We wanted you here with us. We wanted you to be able to come up to them after the service and tell them what a good job they did. We wanted you to pat their fathers and their grandfathers on the back and say, didn't she do such a good job? We wanted you to hug uh, them and their grandmothers and mothers and say, I'm so proud. I'm so excited what they bring. But this is what we have today. And what a great reminder that despite all the challenges in life that we will face, we can still go forward. We can still follow God on his mission. Now, you might think, this was a really weird text to pick for a Confirmation Sunday. And to be honest, I won't argue with you about that. My guess is this isn't the first text that gets picked for these kind of Sundays. But I think there's something in here for both our confirmands and us. So let's pay attention. The book of Ezekiel is a message written 
to Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, during their time of exile under the Babylonians. And chapter 34 is in a section of the book that one commentary entitled, Messages of Hope. Now, my guess is some of you have questions with that. When we read through that, Messages of Hope is not how you might have described that section. Uh, Those of you that know our church well know I have an amount I can spend on books. And you're probably saying, Mark, you need to get some new books. I'm not sure that one you were reading was so great. But let's see. The account is a message from God calling out the shepherds of Israel. In their day, it was common to talk about the shepherd-sheep metaphor um, in a way that you talked about kings and priests and other people in power. The relationship between the people of power and the people that they were to serve. So this has nothing to do with shepherds and sheep. This is speaking to kings and to princes and to queens and to others in power, condemning their abuse of that power. And that's why I think it fits so well with Confirmation Sunday. Because as followers of Jesus, including our confirmands, we are being called to a priesthood. A priesthood that all believers are called to enter. And when you are called to a job, sometimes it is helpful to understand how others have messed it up. But this isn't all about the job being messed up there will be something else for us as well. So did you notice what these leaders were doing? The text said they were feeding themselves, eating the fat, clothing themselves with wool, slaughtering the fatlings, ruling with force and harshness. What were they ignoring? They were ignoring strengthening the weak, healing the sick, binding up the injured, bringing back the strays, seeking the lost and as a result of this the people of Israel were scattered all over the known world they wandered they became food for wild animals staying within the metaphor you could see how that would happen uh, by a poor shepherd a poor shepherd who didn't take care of his flock might just let it go wherever it wants As sickness and injury continued in his flock, there would be more and more losses. And if they weren't fed well, if they weren't led to areas where there was green grass where they could feed well, they might stray off looking for food as they faced hunger. But we need to remove the metaphor. What is Jesus saying? What is God saying to these people, these kings and priests? Well, He's calling them out for exploiting those that were under their care. Maybe they were taxed too much. Um, Maybe they were uh, forced into building projects for the kingdom. But whatever they were doing, it was for the benefit of those in power and not for their benefit. Those in power didn't protect the vulnerable under their care. Their policies or practices may have built their treasuries or made things better for themselves and others in power, but it was at the expense of the vulnerable and the weak. Instead of keeping the kingdom together, their actions caused the people of Israel to be scattered all over. A huge portion of Judah was carried off to Babylon, but some Uh, were left where they were, others scattered trying to find better lands because the kingdom wasn't intact. God's people were all over the place. And in many cases, it wasn't good for them. And what God was saying to these people in power, these shepherds, is the exile is your fault. You caused this. You know, the job description for a shepherd is pretty simple. How are the sheep doing? If the sheep are doing well, you're probably doing your job as a shepherd pretty well. God's sheep were not doing well. These leaders failed the test. Israel's leaders, both religious and political, were acting in a way that benefited them. 
to the detriment of their people. So how about today? What would this look like today? You know, it is very easy to talk about the extremes. Governments that do horrible things, uh, churches or ministries that spend lavishly or have poor theology. I don't find that really helpful to talk about. Well, it makes us feel good about ourselves because we don't do those things. But we can just point and talk about what they do. And oh, I'm glad I don't do that and all these things. But it doesn't have us look at ourselves and say, what are the things that this word might have for us? How could we be guilty of the same things? Lots of ways. Leaders in our church, if they think about what people want and not what they need, could be sucked into a lot of bad things. Maybe we become a church that when somebody quits coming, we never check on them. Because, you know, we got enough people here. It looks good. We're doing well. When teachers or preachers lead lessons that make them popular, instead of delivering the unpopular message that the congregation needs. If we want to be in charge of things, because we want certain events or certain meetings or programs to go the way that we want them to go, not because we're using our gifts and the gifts of these things to benefit the congregation and benefit outside the congregation. Lynn and I went to a church years ago where the previous pastor uh, spent most of his time with the important people in the congregation, the important people in the community. And even though we were there years after that situation had happened, there was still pain in this church. I also thought it was kind of interesting that most of the important people had left the church by this time because the new pastor wasn't treating them like they were special enough. God talks about these shepherds eating the flesh. And you can think about this literally within the metaphor of harvesting a sheep for our own benefit rather than taking care of a sheep and making it grow to where it's supposed to grow. But it also happens outside of the metaphor in our churches and places of power. When a Sunday school teacher uses their influence in class to grow their business, I used to be part of a huge singles ministry, and lots of good things happened in this ministry, in this Sunday school class that we had in this church. But we had some problems too, and one of the ones we regularly faced were people who were there for dating opportunities and not there uh, to see God's mission go forward and to care about this flock. We are learning how to shepherd people by looking at a bad example. And sometimes bad examples are easier to learn, learn from than good. I find myself more motivated to go into a pulpit when I hear someone doing damage. When I hear the words they're saying or the way they're carrying themselves of doing damage on a people group. I'm sure you've seen those situations too. The remainder of the text contains a promise and a model for us that are called to be shepherds, and all of us are called in some way to be shepherds in our church. We get these therefores starting in verse 7, where this is the situation, but because of this situation, this is going to happen. And God says, I'm going to deal with the bad shepherds. Because my people have become food for others. And he talks of the sheep as prey. Sheep are not supposed to be prey. Sheep are supposed to be protected. They're supposed to be okay. They're not in that food chain. They're supposed to be protected. But God says, my sheep are prey. Because they really didn't have a shepherd. Because these shepherds fed themselves and did not feed the sheep. And God promised he would be against these shepherds. He would take the sheep back from them. And he said, you're going to stop feeding these sheep. Because what you're feeding them doesn't make them healthy. It makes them vulnerable. What's it look like to be vulnerable 
because of what you eat. Well, if our church ever gets out of the habit of interpreting God's Word for this community and gets into the habit of only delivering those messages that make you feel warm and fuzzy, we as a congregation will get weak and vulnerable. God said He will save His people from these shepherds. Religious leaders devour their sheep by not telling them what they need to hear and not doing the things that benefit the sheep, but by doing the things that benefit the leaders. And God said, I will take on the ownership of this flock. And the New Testament church is going to hear this and they're going to see this played out in the person of Jesus. They're going to see this come through in Him. That God takes over the control and says, you know, no nation or no person or no anybody can do this. I've got to do this myself. God will search for his sheep and rescue them. He will bring them out of other peoples. Did you notice that little comment? Well, that's making a comment about Gentiles. It gives this beautiful picture of God not just calling the nation of Israel, but calling beyond the nation of Israel. And Israel always struggled with this. They thought that they were right with God because there was something intrinsic about who they were that made them right with God and by following the law. And what God is saying to them is, my flock is way bigger than just this. More is going to happen. God will feed his sheep with good pasture. This picture of lavish provision that God gives. He will make them lie down, bring rest to those that were formerly food, and be with those that he is supposed to care for. This is where hope comes in this text. You see, because while you may be going, wow, this is scary, and all these scary things are being thrown at me, I want you to think about the people that were hearing this. Most of the people hearing this weren't Israel's leaders. I read a stat a while back that said something like 93% of the people uh, at this time in the nation of Israel were subsistence farmers. You know, just barely getting by. They don't hear this being fearful. They hear this as a promise, as a hope of justice as finally our God is going to come through and we're going to have the right kind of shepherd. And again, that shepherd thinking New Testament is Jesus, but even here, God is promising that he's going to come through in a different way. The reality of God's people, the church universal, is that many of us have suffered under poor or even evil shepherds. And this is a promise to us that God will be our shepherd and that he will take care of us. But it's also a call to us and a call to you confirmands to set up the church in a way that cares about the flock in line with how God cares about the flock. If the last two weeks in America have taught us anything, it's that we still have a long way to go. Confirmands. Will you do the things more in line with how God shepherds the sheep than how they have been done? We hope so. Our church, our world, and our country need that from you. Because this account pits two different kinds of shepherds against each other, the one that loves the sheep and the one that sees the sheep as a means to attain something for themselves. The most important thing that we can do as leaders in our church is to love. Love in a way that won't let us stay on the sidelines. Love in a way that demands action. There are going to be people that walk through our doors. Yes, people will walk through our doors in the future. We're holding on to that promise. But there are going to be people that walk through our doors that have been tortured by other congregations, by other spiritual authorities. Will you love them? Will you nurture them back to a place where they can add, where they can contribute to the mission of our congregation? There are going to be people that disagree with the call 
that God has placed on our lives. And it, it hits me today as the confirmands that we are celebrating, all five being young women. What if you're called to the pastorate? Some people will have a problem with that. But will you love them enough that they'll consider it just because it comes from you? Will you learn from the generations before you? Will you repeat what they did right? Will you avoid what they did wrong? You see, I agree with the call that some are saying for pastors to be more prophetic. I think that is a good call. But the speech of a prophet is often lost if it doesn't come through with love. If somebody who doesn't like me tells me a hard thing, you know, it only means so much. But if somebody that loves me delivers a hard message, it gets through. And I care about it. I consider it. Even if my first reaction is, I don't want to hear that. If we know they love them, it matters. Will we love the flock the way God loves the flock? God has taken over care of the flock because he loves them. And he calls us to serve alongside of him in caring for this flock. Confirmants, members of our church, regular participants in the life of our church. Will we follow that call? Will we care for the flock as well? God has taken over the care of this flock. But he invites us along on this journey to shepherd in line with the kingdom he is setting up. All of us need to take him up on this call to action. Let us pray. Creator, Savior, Advocate, you reveal yourself as one God in three persons, a mighty, creative, life-generating essence who invites your creation to join you. Thank you for being a God that experiences the positive aspects of our world with us, but who is also present in the difficulty. These past days are examples of the complexities we face in life. We are so thankful for the confirmands you've called forward. We lift up Kaylee Bleeker, Honest Chipatula, Breezy Dowling, Josephine Henderson, and Lacey Perkle. They are a gift from you, a joy. Help our church to be good stewards of these young women's lives, guiding them to discern your light and responding to it. At the same time, we are deeply saddened by the death of George Floyd. Another reminder of how far we have to go as a country on the issue of race. Help his death be a catalyst that pushes each of us to examine our own racial bigotry and move toward a place that honors you more and more, Lord. Catch us up in your love and help us to mirror it to others, forever guiding our steps in this land full of celebration and pain. Our trust for these changes to happen is in you our loving triune God. Amen. Join us at First Presbyterian Sundays at 8.30 and 10.55 or watch us on My 11 every Sunday morning at 9.